Well, good morning, everybody. Um, so this panel is a little bit different. Over the next two days, you're going to be talking a great deal about the strategic landscape, how it looks in the near term and how it looks at the horizon. And you're going to be talking about the weapons and the actors, the adversaries and the conflicts. What we're going to talk about on this panel is the underlying plate tectonics. So what are the trends and the drivers that shape the strategic landscape that create these conditions that lead to the weapons and the adversaries and the conflicts? Um, so this is all about context. Now, um, what I've asked this panel to talk about, and um, it, we're definitely going to talk about what the title is, but what I've asked the panel to talk about is to look ahead to 2025 and to uh, do some thinking about what is, what is our strategic preoccupation going to be in 2025? What are we going to be concerned about? What threats? What challenges? What is that landscape going to look to, like to us then? And so we're going to have the first half of our conversation will be about that. And then in the second half, we're going to transition over to, so how do we organize for that world? What kinds of institutions do we need? What's our military force structure supposed to look like? What international institutions do we need? Um, do we have? the government, the governance, the means that we need to deal with that world we expect to see in 2025. Um, now, I've asked them to do something a, a little, and I'm going to set a little context myself before we jump into the discussion. But just so you know, I mixed it up a little bit with, uh, with the uh, actual how we're going to do this conversation. And I've asked the panel to do something akin to conference speed dating, which is we're going to start by, they're just going to give you a telegraphic list of what they think the biggest challenges or threats um, or trends, preoccupations are going to be in 2025 without a lot of explanation. We're not going to start with a disquisition. We're going to do this speed dating style, and then we're going to go back and look at that whole picture we have and have a discussion about what that landscape looks like. Um, to prepare for this, I decided I wanted to look back. And I looked at Global Trends 2015, which was written in 2000. And of course, we're in the year that they imagined right now. And I was curious about how well they did at looking forward and anticipating and they did very well indeed. Um, you know, they said that information technology would change everything, and that may not sound like a bolt out of the blue right now, but 15 years ago, you did have to have some imagination to say that it was going to change the world of commerce, that biotechnology would be changing everything, that there would be chronic financial volatility and a widening economic divide that would shape national security, that states would still dominate, but governments would be losing control over the means of governance. They said that the Middle East was going to be um, in chaos with violent extremist movements aimed at their own governments and at the United States, and that governments would be shaken <coughs> to their foundations. Um, they did say that there would be a lot of regional military conflicts, but not major state conflicts. Uh, so it was a pretty good it was a pretty good mix. And even the places where they were wrong are interesting, and I hope we'll talk about it, which is they said, for example, that South Africa would be consumed and uh, completely destabilized by AIDS. So even the places where they weren't quite right, they said that water scarcity would be a huge problem by now. So even some of the places they were wrong may lead to some interesting discussion. So with that, let's jump right into our speed dating. And um, I, to do that, I will turn and introduce you to our panel. And for that, I'm also going to need a cheat sheet, because my goodness, these are impressive people with a lot of titles. Um, first, immediately next to me is Nadia Bliss, who is the director of the Global Security Initiative at Arizona State University. And she's also a professor of practice, and this is the one I need to read, in the School of Computing, Informatics, and Decision Systems Engineering. Before she went to ASU, she was a group leader at Lincoln Laboratories. So you can see this is a very accomplished person. Um, next to her is David um, Gartner, and David also has a lot of titles, which is why I have to read it. Professor of Law, Associate Dean, Faculty Co-Director of the Center for Law and Global Affairs. To put it in a nutshell, he's looking at, at law and international means for dealing with non-state actors and, and trends and, and, uh, devi and drivers. So he's a perfect person to have on this panel as well. And last but certainly not least is uh, Colonel Troy Thomas. He is an active duty US Air Force officer. Um, at the moment, he is director for strategic planning uh, on the National Security Council. So he's one of the top strategists in our government. Before that, he was a top advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He has been deployed in the Middle East and in homeland defense missions uh, as an intelligence officer and a planner and a very sharp guy. So we are glad to have all three of you here 
for an interesting discussion. So Nadia, get us started in the speed dating. <coughs> what do you think we're going to be strategically preoccupied with, or what will be the threat or the concern in 2025? Thanks, Sharon. So I'm not even going to do a list. I'm just going to do one real threat. Complexity and wickedness of borderless threats, particularly in context of uncertainty. OK. <clears throat> wickedness. So I want to highlight top that. I can't top that. <laughs> I, want to, I do want to highlight two that are closely tied to the theme here. One is emerging viruses, and the second is water, and specifically water shortage. And by viruses, you mean? A wide range. Uh, we've seen Ebola. It, it could or be okay, flu. Ebola. I'm All thinking right. more uh, biological. OK. Yeah. All right. All right, well, I've never speed dated, so I'm sure I'm going to blow this. But <laughs> I just want to start by saying good morning. I think you should say hi and thank you. And thank I, you and for having me. Excuse me, I, thank do you have for one, having I do have one thing I want to, um, I want to point out about Troy, and I, and I sorry, I did you a disservice. Troy is here in a personal capacity, so he is not here speaking on behalf of the administration. Oh, so just thanks for that. That's a good, that's a good point. Um, <laughs> so I, I think we're in for a period of extended uh, volatility in the security landscape, and I think. You know, although the nature of war is unchanging, its character is ever-changing in that regard, I think we're looking at future wars being communal and increasingly criminal, involving these complex coalitions of state, non-state actors fighting out of fear more than out of interest, using largely methods that are focused on disruption and dislocation. All right. Now explain to us what you mean by wickedness. Okay, so um, this is a little bit challenging. So Sharon uh, mentioned, I am at my core a math geek, um, actually. So spent a decade at MIT Lincoln Laboratory where everything was focused on building the best solution to something. I think a lot of the challenges that we're facing today, it's a little bit depressing, but don't really have solutions. Essentially, the definition of a wicked problem, there's been a lot of discussions of wicked problems lately, um, is where you have conflicting objectives and interdependencies and likely no solutions. A good example of this is climate change. Um, I'd say cybersecurity is probably another one of those. We can try to build the most resilient cyber system in the world, but there's still, you know, that executive is still going to click on that link from his or her mom. So when we're dealing with wicked problems, we have to account for those interdependencies. We have to account for those interconnectivities. We have to understand that there's no real separation between water insecurity and food insecurity, and even postulate that resource insecurity is likely going to lead to political instability. And often what we see, the discourse on the ground, is not really connected to realities of what's going on in a particular country. And furthermore, the, um, the notion of all of these issues, so cybersecurity, climate change, pandemics, uh, lone wolf type of, um, type of threats, none of them are actually anchored in a particular country. So we can't say, you know, well, we're going to worry about Russia or we're we going to worry about Iran or Iraq. We have to think about this holistic, um, holistic interconnected, to be honest, mess. And um, I think the one other thing that I'll say about this is there is, so it's, it sounds a little bit depressing, but I think there is a tremendous opportunity for collaboration, collaboration um, across nations, collaboration across agencies. So I spent a career working with the DOD and the intelligence community, and now I've been reaching out to folks in USAID and state. And what we're actually beginning to realize is that you know, the challenges that the Defense Department faces, uh, faces in their phase zero mission operations is actually a development challenge that USAID tries to implement. So um, I guess the bottom line is, is I don't think we're facing the type of threats where if we build just a faster computer, if we build a better rocket, if we build a better radar, if we build a precision targeting system, I think that's not enough. I think there's a need to account for quite a diverse, uh, diverse set of factors across these multiple layers. So, so well, let, me, let me ask you then, Troy, when you say volatility and disruption, is it, are you saying the same thing as wickedness, just using different words, or do you mean something different? No, I think I, I do mean the, the same thing. I mean, I, when you look, you know, there, <clears throat> there's a 
saying that there are no national security problems, there's only dilemmas. And the <laughs> dilemmas seem to be getting increasingly complicated, both in terms of the number of variables you have to attend to and at the rate at which those variables are, are, are changing. And then mostly, um, as we think about strategies and, and structures for the future of conflict, I think we're largely thinking about the relationships among these things. Mm -hmm. So David, how, does, how do viruses, because you were very specific, so are viruses emblematic of, of what Troy and Nadia are talking about, or, or is there a reason you picked that above other things? Sure, well let me maybe start from the, the big picture and, and, move, and move kind of to zero in of viruses. So I think what, what both comments have highlighted is that the future threats we're gonna face, or the, some of the biggest future threats, are increasingly global rather than international. In other words, they're not state to state, uh, as much as they are from a range of non-state actors or even from a range of dynamics like climate and viruses. Um, they're also increasingly going to involve, uh, the solutions are going to increasingly involve collaboration not just across different agencies and across different governments and perhaps require new forms of global cooperation. We'll get to that. But, <laughs> but non-state actors as well. Threats. No, I just yeah. want to set the context. So sure. within that, so let me give a, a recent example, the Ebola crisis. Right. What, this is a virus that's actually been around for some time, although it's evolved, and this is the first outbreak that's reached the United States. It's the first outbreak that's um, killed uh, as many people as it has. Um, but this is a, a reflection of sort of failure to engage in surveillance. It took four months to discover that this actually was Ebola, and it was Doctors Without Borders who discovered it. It took another six months before there was any major investment by any country, and it was our country that then led the way, but that was still a delay. And the biggest sort of delay, if you think about it, is that we don't have a vaccine for what, at least in scientific terms, is not as complicated a virus as, say, the AIDS virus or other things. And the reason we don't is because the initial investments we made after 9-11, uh, which were quite substantial in biodefense, um, weren't able to take things to the end stage. And so we need sort of new systems to innovate to get the, the kind of drugs ahead of the curve. So I, I think it relates to this set of complexity, but also it relates to the complexity of our own, how we organize government and how we organize international institutions. So were we lucky with Ebola? I think we were lucky. Um, people, however, in West Africa have not been so lucky. Liberia is right. in, in real, relatively good shape. Guinea and Sierra Leone, this is not dying out. I mean, it, it, it may indeed um, become a new flashpoint that could reach our shores. But, but I think it's, a, it's, in a sense, a warning shot about the kinds of viruses of the future um, and the ways in which we're going to need to reorganize to respond. So if we don't, okay, so this is, you do see this becoming worse. Why, why is it becoming worse? Well, I don't know that it'll be Ebola. I mean, it could sure, be no. flu. So right. let me, there, there are strains of flu circulating right now in China that have 60% uh, of the people die who, who get the flu. That's actually on par with what we've seen with Ebola. Um, they haven't reached our shores yet. Um, but as we know with flu, it, it mutates, it travels quickly, it's actually much more infectious than Ebola. Um, we also know that this is now some 50 times more lethal than the Spanish flu, which was one of the biggest killers in World War I. So um, in order to get ahead of this curve, you've got to have the surveillance mechanisms to identify it, you have to have the, the sort of the will and the resources to invest, and you have to have the technology and the incentives to develop medicines to sort of protect us and to protect um, uh, people around the world. So it's also partly how these things fit together. Yes. Absolutely. I, Absolutely. I mean, would the Spanish flu have killed as many people if it weren't on the back of a war? No, perhaps not. But, but conflicts, current conflicts, are, are no less sort of subject to the conditions that would, would lead to such outbreaks. Maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things, so I want to throw on the table, I was looking, the World Economic Forum put out recently a Global Risks 2015 report and they made a difference between likelihood and impact. Mm -hmm. So they said the likeliest risk is interstate conflict, but the biggest impact is water crisis. Mm -hmm. The second one was extreme weather events, but the biggest impact was the spread of infectious disease. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit more about where that goes in 2025. I mean, what do you think, what do you think is, what's the president in 2025 gonna be worried about, Troy? Well, certainly. It's gonna be a daily <clears throat> briefing. Yeah, certainly yeah, it's, <laughs> and it's, still, it's still going to be as it is today, climate change and disease, but it's also going to be geopolitics. I don't think we want to discount the, uh, the threat posed from, from other states. I think, I think broadly we're looking at sort of three trends that will intersect in a way to create a heightened sense of risk at both an individual level and a social level. So one trend would be sort of this proliferation of both power and advanced technology. Um, more actors have more access. 
uh, to, to both power and technology than ever before, and too many of them are spoilers, and too many of them are able to project that violence. I think a second trend is sort of a crisis in institutional authority, where states and multilateral institutions are underperforming, um, not able to solve some of these problems and meet expectations, and that leads to sort of this new norm of inaction and non-compliance with obstructionists in the system. And the third, I think, uh, trend would be, I think there'll be an escalation in identity politics as new forms of identity entrepreneurs take advantage of all these new forms of media and this heightened sense of individual insecurity to try and mobilize people, um, and in some cases to, to, to violence. And the three of those trends intersecting, I think, create this sort of sense of global risk. I, I'm reminded of uh, the German sociologist Ulrich Beck, who just passed away last month, but he wrote about a world risk society. He said, risk is the, condition, the human condition in the 21st century. And, and our misperception of risks can often lead to us acting out of fear and an excess of precaution to maybe apply resources in places that aren't sort of the, the wisest. So I think, I think we'll be basically managing global risk in 2025 across all of these dimensions. There's two things I'd like um, all of you to talk about with that. And you know, first with Nadia, managing global risk, and particularly when you're talking about all these threads that, that tie together, and it's you know, mutually interdependent system. Um, how do we untie that enough to know how to approach it? So what I'd like you to talk a little bit about is how you model, and what it means to model all those drivers and how they affect each other. And then also um, maybe lift out climate change and talk about with traditional military threats and some of the things you're talking about, Troy, how a condition like that um, affects, you know, maybe jump right into that, both of you, how mm -hmm. water stress and water scarcity or climate change, you know, what's the language we use or we, that we are using as a government to explain how it affects mm -hmm. threats? We'll we start there just because I want to lift that out a little bit. So, you know, how does it, climate change is not a threat. We're not going to go attack it with the military. <laughs> But how does it affect well, the I think it is. It, it, I think we do consider it a, a threat to our okay. Why? A threat to our um, security. I mean, in some respects, um, extreme weather events are destructive um, and and disruptive. They're not a threat in the sense that we're. It's the threat or use of force, military force, against us. But in terms of our economic prosperity, our security, um, the prosperity and security of others that is connected to us. Um, I think in particular the manifestations of climate change, particularly in terms of extreme weather, um, certainly affects our, affects our security. And I know we've talked too, and also it's in a lot of the defense and the national security strategy, not that we're talking about that right now, but um, <laughs> is that it's a, a, an accelerator or a, a threat multiplier, right? That where you already have an unstable state and a, and a violent movement, and then when you also add in water shortages um, and food scarcity and extreme weather and people have to move, that's when it turns into something more than just unhappiness into instability. I mean, Is that a fair? Absolutely. Yeah. I would just say absolutely. I mean, it's not only a, they're not only threats in their own right because they're disruptive and they're destructive, but as part of the conditions that make communities ripe for mobilization, that give, that exacerbate, compound conflict, um, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, can can just to pick up that? on that theme, I mean, so water shortage will be a source of conflict in the, in the, in the not too distant future, right? Why? I mean, we see, well, um, Ethiopia is trying to harness the Nile, and Egypt may not let that happen, and that may turn into a violent conflict. Even today, in the context of, of the Middle East, we see strategic battles over the Mosul Dam, uh, strategic, you know, uh, battles. Uh, perhaps to come over the Fallujah Dam. So it's currently an issue, but I think it's these longer term issues that we need to be thinking about. So here at home, we've got a 50% chance of a mega drought, a 30 year drought in my region in the Southwest, an 80% chance of one that'll be 10 years, which is as long as, as, as was the case in the Dust Bowl. What does that mean in terms of our food security here at home? This is not just a future problem. Sao Paulo is the largest city in Latin America, is running out of water as we speak, despite being in one of the most water-rich regions of the world. So what does that mean in terms of migrations across borders? What does that mean in terms of competition over resources to come? I think it'll be quite dramatic, unfortunately. I think it's really important for people to understand that um, there have always been water challenges, and states have always had conflict and generally have worked it out without going to war. 
but we're entering an era when there's going to be absolute scarcity of some of these resources, and that's a different baseline. So it's hard to know how those things are going to get worked out. But and talk to us so. about how we, and can we actually understand these complexities and how they interact? So I think I'd like to actually pick up on a couple of points that uh, David also mentioned. So Ebola, um, the, the outbreak was rather significant, the most significant in the history of the outbreaks. And I think you know, some of the scientists have observed that one of the reasons for this was the urbanization of the area where the outbreak occurred. And this is mm -hmm. a perfect example where things are interconnected. So typically these outbreaks have been happening in rural regions as opposed to these densely populated urban regions. Similarly, dengue fever. There's studies out there that are showing that climate change is exacerbating dengue fever and potentially to catastrophic effects. So I think one of the things that we have to accept, so certainly from a technologist, academic research perspective, is we have to get comfortable with uncertainty. We're not going to be able to have a perfect set of risk maps over everything. And I will say, risk, identifying risk and areas of risk is probably one, one of the biggest challenges that we can address together as a, as a community. So there are exquisite models. There are exquisite models of atmospheric uh, patterns. There are exquisite models of you know, temperature rising. There are exquisite models of water resource management in various areas. And sometimes we're still sitting out there debating whether climate change exists. So I think there's a couple things here. One, we have to start to get the communities talking. So the disease community, the CDC, and the folks that are doing disease models, usually it's mathematicians that are working uh, with bioinformatics type of folks, have to be talking to the people that are studying climate change and working together. That's a tremendous challenge, and I'll know we'll get into that a little yes. bit later. The other component there, we have to appreciate the connectivity of everything. A lot of the times we have this tendency to study just the Southwest, for the water, or you know, just the Middle East, or just the Niger River Basin, or just something else. We have to appreciate that all of these things are tightly interconnected, which means understanding communication networks, understanding transportation networks, understanding all of those. And there are tools out there that you can use to start doing those sort of models, but there has to be an appreciation that we're not going to be able to come out with an answer. So as we're talking out to policymakers, it's not a matter of saying, look, we've solved it, or you know, <laughs> climate change done, or disease done, but that we've identified almost like a risk landscape that we can, um, we can kind of evaluate with a variety, a variety of experts. So you can model complexity to the degree that you can start giving options for how to manage risk? To some degree, I think, w without a doubt. So, you know, complexity in complex systems is, you know, a, a burgeoning um, science. And I think a lot of this ties back to um, study of networks, um, so relationships between entities, whether it's communication networks or um, social networks or infrastructure networks. There's tremendous challenges. There are uh, mathematical challenges, there are computational challenges, but at the moment what we still tend to do is look at all of these events in isolation. And I think that's events, ne nexi, I don't know if nexi is the right term, it's probably nexus. It, you know, it's not a water energy nexus, it's not a water food nexus, it's not a water disease nexus, it's an all of those nexus. And um, I think that is something that we can start addressing. And if yes. we don't, we'll keep coming up with you know, half well, measures and so, yes. inadequate solutions. Yeah, and, and Let, Let's sorry. transition to okay. that, to the solution <laughs> set. So let's talk <laughs> about, um, I mean, so that Global Trends yeah. report said all the things you're saying, like I said, urbanization, population mm -hmm. growth, uh, water, climate, confessional groups, identity politics, um, the, the rapid spread of more powerful weapons, they're all going to be a problem in 2015, and lo and behold, they are. But we didn't really do anything necessary. We didn't do nothing, but we didn't create the means to, to prepare for, prevent, deal with that world. So we are where we are. Um, are we ready <clears throat> for the 2025 that you all see? And if we're not, if this current government, I personally, just coming out of government, I do not believe that the US government is organized to manage complexity. Um, and the Department of Defense extensively uses modeling and simulation to plan for the future. 
but I do not believe they use MS tools to model complexity. Mm -hmm. um, I do not think that we're organized. I think it's very difficult to reorganize on an international scale, even harder. And I think all, you know, all the cry you hear today about, we don't have a strategy, we need a strategy, at bottom is, is really discomfort with complexity. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the world won't yield to a single straight line linear strategy. That's my opinion. Now let's hear yours. Can I jump in on that? Please. Yeah. So, you know, I like that you started with sort of predictions for today. And yeah. some of those predictions yeah. didn't play out, right? The prediction that South Africa and indeed yeah. most of Sub-Saharan Africa that. would be dominated by AIDS. It's not to say it's not a major challenge still. Why is that the case? Well, it's the case in part because of some, you know, a coming together, a sort of bipartisan coalitions that are unheard of here in Washington these days. But, but one that invested in reorganizing the American government and reorganizing global institutions to respond to this challenge. So how did, okay. what did that look like? Well, in terms of the United States government, it had to do with single-minded focus on clear targets and outcomes in a way that frankly isn't commonplace, uh, not just in the development space, but in, in most areas. And in, in terms of elevating to sort of presidential level interest and organizing in a, in a new sort of interagency model through this. I'm talking about PEPFAR, George W. Bush's um, plan for AIDS relief. But the second thing, which is just as important, is the invention of a new global institution, which is based on a multi-stakeholder model of governance, right? So no longer just having governments at the table, but having the NGOs like the Doctors Without Borders that I mentioned earlier, having corporations like some of the companies that are sort of investing in these new pharmaceuticals, having foundations like the Gates Foundation that's one of the biggest players in the global health context now, as well as folks from the, from the global south. So it's really a new model of governance to respond to these challenges both at the global level and at the national level. So they sort of match this at the national level to try and create new conversations. It's this kind of multi-stakeholder approach to governance that I think could be quite valuable and building out institutions to deal with water, perhaps to deal with you know, issues about urban climate change as we move forward in terms of uh, uh, thinking about the sustainable development goals. So I'm actually optimistic that we have emerging models out there. I just think that we're not applying what we've learned broadly enough. How about you, Troy? What do you think? So I would, I would align myself with this idea that uh, you know, sort of strategic success in the future is a function of sort of competitive coalition building, putting together these complex coalitions of state and non-state, public and private actors. Um, <clears throat> be able to do that more quickly, organize it, mobilize it, uh, put it into action more so than those you're competing with, whether that's an adversary like ISIL or it's a, a natural disaster like, uh, uh, or, a, uh, or a, a disease epidemic. So, you know, and I think we do have, we have models of that in the past and in the present that have, that have worked. We've seen, it, we've seen it in response to natural disasters in the past. We've seen us rapidly mobilize a coalition to deal with ISIL today, but I think there's going to be more of a premium on that in the future. And frankly, the U.S. Can you be more specific now about what that means for the armed forces? Are you, you know, how do they have to organize then to deal with this? Like, you know, with Ebola, we can do right. that, right? But we're not organized for it. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say we're not we're not organized for it. I mean, is it I think, the right tool I think the, going forward? I think the U.S. military historically has proven to be a remarkably versatile tool and very responsive. And I think uh, the Ebola, uh, Ebola is a case where the speed, reach, industrial strength of the armed forces was the right tool to rapidly sort of mobilize and provide a platform and lay down some capabilities that then could be transitioned over um, to um, to more of a civilian, civilian capability. And it was done in support of the lead government agency, USAID, and with all of these other partners, like global communities and lots of other NGOs and, and, and IGOs. So in some respects, uh, setting aside the, mm -hmm. the timeliness of the response, yeah. um, the model, I think that's the kind of model that will work in the, in the future. So for the military, I think that puts a premium not on a lot of specialization, but on versatility and responsiveness. Mm -hmm. So tell me how that means, what that means for force structure. What, if you could, um, you know, talk to the chairman and, and say, here's what you need to do when you wave your wand. What is, in 2025, is there a different force structure or force posture? Do we need a different military? I don't think we need a fundamentally uh, different, different military. I, th I do think that you, um, it would be um, sort of irresponsible not to pre prepare to defend the nation from high-end conventional or nuclear mm -hmm. warfare. I think that's always been the, the case and that will remain true. But in preparing for that kind of threat, 
I think you will then also need to preserve and prepare some of the capabilities that you will need to deal with some of these more transnational, non-traditional security challenges. And frankly, the key to that, to me, is not necessarily the technology or even the force structure, but it's the leadership development. And I think that's really what the US military brings to bear in a way um, that few others do, and that is leaders that are adaptive and agile and can combine capabilities or draw on capabilities like our tremendous medical capacity or logistics capacity and bring that to bear rapidly as we did in the case of uh, Ebola. If I can yeah, just add please. to that. So, I mean, I, I think the other component there, I agree with you, the sort of the traditional threats are not going away. We have to uh, make sure that we account for those. Um, but I think overall, we can be a lot more strategic in our response instead of tactical. So the response to Ebola was actually quite well executed, but it was very much tactical. It was a crisis that needed to be responded to right away. If we plan for things in advance, if we have a set of risk maps, if we have a set of these interconnected uh, type of relationships between various potential threats, there's an opportunity for us to get in there earlier and be prepared. And that's why, you know, the reason climate change is scary is because it also takes away our forces from the threats that may be emerging and require a tactical response, right? Dealing with the hurricanes, dealing with extreme weather, dealing with earthquakes, dealing with nuclear meltdowns because of earthquakes and tsunamis, all of that takes away from the need to still respond to those, to those tactical threats. And I mean, to be fair, one of the things that I think is really important and I resonate with Troy is the leadership has to recognize this. So this notion that we need to be more strategic in our planning is, is something that must be recognized at the highest levels. And to be honest, the Quadrennial Defense Review, one of the three pillars of our defense strategy is build security globally. So it is clearly recognized in the top level strategy document of the Department of Defense. Are we doing that? That's another question. Um, I think our... Who, who would be doing that? If we were gonna be building security, um, do we have the civilian expeditionary capacity to do it? Hmm. So I think it requires cross-agency, private, academia, all of those partnerships to be engaged. And, and I think it's not one of those things that you can... I don't think you can force it. Right? There is a recognition that this is a need. There is a recognition that this is a very important need, but it requires a few key leaders to say, we will be more transparent in our actions. We will be more collaborative in our actions. We will build coalitions with other governments and other agencies. And I don't think that's a trivial thing, but I, I think overall we can do it. Uh, that's I hope what we can you were saying it. worked in the case of AIDS, but can we yeah. afford to keep doing it this way where we have a, you know, sort of a, um, outer crust of, a, of an institution in the United States and across the world, and then we have to build on top of it to actually handle? I, I fear we can't afford not to, right? I mean, in the sense that... Well, we can't so, change. So I have, a, I have a slightly different take on Ebola, right? And okay. it's not just about the U.S. response, it's about the global response. So we have a World Health Organization, which is dominated to a too large degree by regional fiefdoms, including a fiefdom in Africa that was slow to respond. Right? in part because national governments didn't want to admit that they had this level of crisis. Um, and so it's not just that the, I think the US government should have responded more quickly, but that globally, we don't have the sort of the security of health infrastructure, which is part of what we're gonna need around the world to protect us from emerging infectious disease, nor do we have the surveillance capacity at the level that we need. And then within the US government, I'd be interested in hearing more about this, I think there's, there's the challenge where the urgent displaces the, these longer range yep. threats, right? The kind so of important, the the what, I, what we're saying is the important. Right. And, yep. and I don't, you know, this is where maybe uh, others' expertise would be more helpful. And he's How do we reorganize? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, your office is thinking long-term strategy, but, but in a sense, it's somewhat of an outlier, I think, in terms of the inboxes of, 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 of many officials. So how do you get ahead of the, the crisis of the day? Well, I think many of the folks in here have been in, uh, been in government, and they know that the inbox is certainly a, a challenge, and the, the urgent can sometimes crowd out the, the strategic. But I, I think you would find in every, every department and agency, and certainly in the National Security Council, 
that a, a good bit of bandwidth is, is going to some long-range planning. I mean, you certainly can't argue that we're not doing some long-range planning to deal with climate change or global health security or um, that we're not focused on the future by rebalancing our attention more to, to, to Asia. And so there's, there's not a day that goes by, at least in my, my experience at the Pentagon and at the, at the National Security Council, where some significant portion of the institution isn't dedicating itself to the future. Maybe not the deep, deep future, uh, maybe not always 30 years out, uh, but often the, at least the near, the near to midterm future. So, I, you know, but that's not what, you know, that's not what's covered in the, in the news, you know, our long-term right. planning yes. for the, um, but sometimes it is, you know. And I think one of the challenges then is how you get the resources, the means involved in that conversation so that you can have a quadrennial defense review that recognizes we need to lay the foundation and recognizes that climate change is a, will be a problem in 2025, but are we actually then investing? Mm -hmm. toward that end? And are we creating the institutions? And I, I want to ask again, mm -hmm. maybe more bluntly, do we need to, are, is it possible to restructure and destroy and remake institutions, or do we just have to accept that it is what it is and build them ad hoc to where we need them? Um, I think it's really hard. There's a, there's a deep path dependence with institutions. So the kind of multi-stakeholder governance that I mentioned, the reason the World Health Organization doesn't have it is because it's sort of a 20th century product of the post-World War II era, and it's an interstate institution. It's pretty hard to turn those into multi-stakeholder institutions. We don't have a lot of examples of that. We have more examples of 21st century institutions, especially in the health context, but not only in the health context, which are embracing this model. So, you know, when we think about some of the water challenges, I think that might be a good candidate for, for a, a new set of institutions internationally. Within the government, I think one of the issues that I've seen, you know, on the sort of development side of this is that the, the integration right now of state and AID puts pressure on the sort of shorter term planning. It can be helpful in, in you know, current operations in the way that, um, that Nadia mentioned, but it can, get, it can get even within the government, I think, away from thinking about these longer term drivers of, of climate or emerging diseases. Can you, can you talk a little bit, Nadia, about um, some of the work you're doing on climate change with social media? Sure. Um, so I guess um, to, to your earlier question, I think it is possible to reorganize an institution. Our President Michael Crow has done it um, pretty successfully, I think. So it's a big institution. Yes. So, yes. so um, and actually, I mean, to be honest, the restructuring a university and restructuring agencies towards a more multi-mission orientation is, is not, um, I would claim it's not that different. It's, it's rather a significant restructuring. So if we, if we talk a little bit about um, this holistic approach to understanding and tracking some of these risks, so what the tendency is is to completely separate the models from the real-time analytics or real-time analysis of what's going on on the ground from the historical past of what has happened. And um, some, of the, um, some of the research that's um, ongoing presently at ASU is actually to combine all three of those domains. So you have this seamless interaction between the past, the present, and the future to allow you to navigate through various spaces. I'll give you um, a semi-concrete a semi -concrete example. So one of the things that we're looking at is um, scarcity of scarcity of water. Uh, a good example of that is, of course, the South Southwest. Well, of course, one of the things that you can do is you can actually track social media um, as to the reference to the word drought or reference to the word scarcity or flood or something like that. And what that actually allows you to do is look at the framing of the dialogue on the ground. So what is framing? Using certain types of keywords to encourage or discourage a certain interpretation. So what does that actually mean? What does that actually mean from an implementation perspective? Well, if you can look at the Southwest and project 30 or 40 years out and realize that there's going to be a significant drought, and you know that the framing of the discourse is focused on, say, um, need for investment in infrastructure or need for new policy, you know what sort of implementation will actually be more effective on the ground. The other component to this is you can actually use social media as almost like a temperature in absence of real data. So you may not be able to go in and measure scarcity in detail in every single country, but you can get it as essentially, you know, 
a test. How is it going? Are people worried about this? And sometimes what's, what's interesting, so there's research that people forget things very fast. So for example, we were looking at California and Arizona, and there's, we do have significant drought issues, and there was a period of rain, and all of a sudden everybody stopped talking about drought, right? And drought is a long-term strategic problem. It doesn't go away with one period of rain. So that's, that's just a little bit of an example. That's great. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Yeah. from the audience. Um, so, yes, we have one right here. Uh, yes. If you wish to be recorded for all time, yes. <laughs> Hi, Simone Garrow from Control Risks. Um, where does the changing oil market fit into all of this? Mm. Uh, it's a good question, and yeah. interestingly enough, <laughs> Global Trends, yeah, Global Trends 2015 yeah. said we'd be fine, that uh, most of the world's resources were still in the ground, and that by 2015 it wouldn't be a problem. Um, I think one of the interesting things about about the oil market is the real problem is concentration of supply, and volatility, political volatility, where it's concentrated. So as long as the United States is part of a global market, that concentration of supply in other countries like Russia, Iran, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, that's going to, con Iraq, it's going to continue to be a very volatile market. And the ups and downs will continue to be a challenge for the global economy and for the political economy. So I think that's a long-term trend when it comes to oil. Um, I also think that right now the world consumes something like 89 million barrels a day. Um, the global economy runs on this stuff. Uh, it's going to be a tough transition, um, and we're going to have to make sure that hundreds of millions of people still have access to energy today and also lay in the future um, for a different kind of energy economy, or it's going to be much worse. Um, so it's an interesting dynamic, for sure, the way that energy destabilizes. And we talk about organizing, and you know, one last plug from me, and then let's take another question, is that uh, my office was an experiment in, um, that I ran in the Department of Defense in, in a, how to manage an issue that cuts across. And that is a, a long-term multi-stakeholder issue. And my office has been eliminated since. So <laughs> the, um, things pop up and they pop down as, as yeah. need be. And um, I think our goal was to, ch was to try to influence the larger institution. And that has to be a part of the solution. Um, yes, sir. And then um, we do have someone who really wants to ask a question, so we'll get to that next. Uh, Ken Meyer, World Docs. Uh, it's been 70 years since the uh, atomic bomb was first used, and if you look at the progress in biology, chemistry, electronics, uh, since that time, it uh, seems to mean that, uh, that we have probably developed some weaponry that we're not even familiar with. Uh, that may make uh, the prospect of a future Armageddon based on something other than nuclear war possible. Uh, for instance, people have been talking for 20 years about a, a weapon that could target enemies based on genotype, which gives new meaning to the word genocide. Uh, in that regard, uh, do we know whether we're weaponizing Ebola? David? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think, you know, there are a number of conventions against um, biological weaponry. We're, we're um, not. So yes. uh, yeah. I would I would hope not. not and imagine not. <laughs> no, that, but you're raising the possibility that there's some non-state actor out there who might try to, and I think that is not perhaps as remote a possibility as we would wish it to and be. And there are certainly states yeah. that, and including the one we're sitting in, that have developed um, biological and chemical agents in the past. So it's not an unrealistic question as a state weapon either, but Troy, do you have any comment on I have no... Well, think, think ahead right. again, 10 years from now, uh, are the weapons going to be different, and are we going to see weapons like this? Oh, I, th I, I would think abs absolutely. I mean, I'm not uh, a future technologist, but uh, and there's some panels that will go into that. There'll but, be a lot of discussion but, on it. But certainly, um, uh, bioweapons are a tremendous concern, which is why we've invested so much in, in biodefense, and if there were you know, things that could cause extinction-like events, if not globally, but regionally, it would be something like a, an, an epidemic, particularly an airborne pathogen, mm -hmm. that could uh, very quickly move and wipe out uh, major portions of the population. So we've got to be prepared for that. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Glenn with the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, and thanks a lot for a really stimulating conversation. I want to ask you all to talk a little bit more about the kind of complex coalitions required for these problems. 
and suggest one example there. When we're seeing some of the changes about it's in some ways changing roles of government or the private sector or academia. I mean, if you look 50, 60 years ago, overwhelmingly the capital flows in the developing world were from official development assistance. Mm -hmm. Today, the figure estimates are that's about 10%. So sometimes in our work, we say that rather than substituting for private capital as it needed to do in the past, government needs now to leverage private capital because what the private sector can do well is bring things to scale. That's one example and a model of thinking about it. But rather than, I'd like to ask you to take a step further than we need complex coalitions. What are those roles? What are those responsibilities and how they recall, how do they necessitate us to change the way we may think about those people? So are governments becoming leverage and catalyst instead of <laughs> the driver? Is that just reality? I mean, but it doesn't, Good. it doesn't seem yeah. to be right now. But. Good. Go ahead, I, let, me, let me pick up on that theme. So, as we're thinking towards um, a new set of goals, right, integrating development and, and the environment, sustainability, sustainable development goals, one idea that I think could have great value is to try and leverage private finance, especially bond finance, for cities, because cities are the drivers of our emissions, they're also the drivers of our economic growth. And yet the reality is, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, only Dakar, outside of South Africa, has actually been able to have any bond issue, and they were only able to do that because USAID um, helped support it. So why don't we think more broadly about the kind of green investments to deal with these water shortages, to deal with some of the health infrastructure? Um, but to do that, frankly, it, it won't happen by itself. You do, I do need government to incentivize, to leverage, sometimes to back um, these kinds of financings, and, it, and we may need new forms of global cooperation to do it. So I, I think you're quite right that that's an avenue to look at, and I think it sort of feeds into the kinds of conversation we've been having. Let's, and let's have some more commentary on that, but also if you would now morph it into sort of your closing thoughts. Um, so if you would, okay. about where we're gonna be in 2025 okay. and how, how we do this, how we create these coalitions that'll allow us to govern in that world. So um, I guess one of the very specific things in terms of, in terms of partnerships, um, I do think there's a tremendous opportunity for very strong partnership within the government with the Department of Defense Intelligence Community and USAID. I mean, that just a, a short personal anecdote. When I started at ASU, I was working on a lot of defense-related issues, and literally my next door office mate was focused on development and USAID. And for about four months, we did not talk at all except say hi to each other in the hallway. And then four months into my tenure there, we, we sort of were in a meeting together and we realized we were thinking about exactly the same thing. Like, I mean, exactly the same things. And if you think about something that I said earlier, so phase zero operations, pre-kinetic operations, our development operation. So very strong collaboration there, I think, um, is something that is both necessary and possible. And I guess from a closing, uh, from a closing point perspective, so one of the things that um, Sharon sent to all of us in preparation for this was sort of, can we end on a positive note? And to be honest, not just on Pollyanna and all, I, I really think we can. I think everything that I am hearing from both partners within the U.S. and international discussions that uh, we've been having with partners outside of the U.S., there's this general understanding at very high levels that there's this need for cooperation and collaboration. And I think we all understand that we don't live in like this closed all society and we have, we have to work together in the presence of uncertainty, in the presence of wickedness to address these challenges together. And to be honest, that's the only way we're gonna be able to do it. Troy, last thought? <laughs> well, I, I, certainly, I certainly agree with that. I'd begin with, uh, first of all, you know, it's, it's about it's about relationships, and the United States is well positioned in that regard globally because our diplomats, our development professionals, our service members are out there in every part of the world, and that's important that we, we sort of build on those relationships so that we can actually rapidly mobilize these coalitions. I think there's other some real practical things we can do. We can share information mm -hmm. more. We can take more risk with information sharing. It's something we have a comparative advantage in as a, as a nation and as a, as a government, and it's a, it's a low cost, high impact way to build trust and we keep these coalitions together. And the other thing I would add is this um, idea is even as we develop sort of these sophisticated capabilities to fight kind of high end wars, they still have to be able to plug and play with people that can't keep, keep pace. 
So we put a premium on interoperability. I think we also got to think about sort of cooperability, capabilities that allow people that have don't quite have an F-22 or an F-35, but be able to communicate and integrate so that when we are using our military, we can do it with a bigger coalition. So we have to build the enabling platforms to, to have these kinds of pop-up coalitions. Yep. David, any last thoughts? Yeah, just quickly, um, thanks for, uh, for having this panel. I think it's really important to keep this focus on long-term drivers of insecurity. I think it's important to remember the, in, the role of the United States in the past and potentially in the future in catalyzing the kinds of global cooperation institutions I was talking about. And lastly, to think about leveraging non-state actors as allies in solving these problems, even as in the short term, obviously, we need to address those non-state actors who are causing problems. Well, uh, this is a great panel, and I would ask you to applaud them not just for what they said to you today, but for the fact that all three of them are actually walking the walk, and they're doing, they're trying to do, and prepare for that future and help um, prepare this country for how to be um, successful in a more complicated future. So these are practitioners and thinkers, and let's give them a hand. Thanks.